There are enough hydrogen bombs on Earth to destroy every human being. But 60 years ago, there was no such thing. And one man was determined to keep it that way. The hydrogen bomb is not a weapon of war. It is a weapon of genocide, and it will destroy humanity. Robert Oppenheimer claimed he was defending the human race. Will we build the single most violent, destructive, indiscriminate weapon ever conceived by mankind to prevent war? His enemies believed he should be crushed for betraying America. His wife was a member of the Communist Party. His brother, his friends, all communists. Was the world heading for Armageddon? Your country needs you now to demonstrate that we can match the Americans kiloton for kiloton, megaton for megaton. Your colleague has been arrested in London. Have you ever been a communist, Mr. Oppenheimer? I did indeed associate with known communists. I married one. You seen enough now, Mr. F.B. fucking I, man? Did you or did you not give away secrets of the H-bomb to the Russians? You're indestructible, Robert. Well, you're not. Mrs. Oppenheimer, are you telling me to slow down? You? I'm telling you not to act like an idiot. Hey. You're not a kid anymore. And when you fall, you take longer to mend. So, you know, don't fall. Atomic power! Atomic power! After the Second World War, America was looking forward to a bright atomic future. Atomic cities, cities near atomic plants, are pleasant places of comfortable and well-built family homes. As the only country with the atom bomb, it felt secure. Twenty-ninth of August, 1949. The Soviets stun the world by exploding their own atom bomb. Suddenly, the West itself was under threat. Edward Teller, a leading physicist from Hungary, believed the only way to save the world from Soviet communism was to build an even bigger bomb, the hydrogen bomb, or super. It will create the heat of the sun here on Earth. Temperatures never before experienced on this planet. The atom bomb was just the beginning. Now imagine a fireball that could consume the whole of Manhattan Island reducing every human being in a three-mile radius to ash. A shock wave that would flatten every building in the five boroughs. One bomb, perhaps 1,000 times more powerful than Hiroshima. Now imagine not one, but tens, hundreds, raining down on American cities. Millions will die. America will die. And that is why America must be prepared, must build a hydrogen bomb, must build it now. What does Oppenheimer have to say about all this, Edward? Robert Oppenheimer was the mastermind behind the world's first atomic bombs. Bombs which had destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands. I am very proud of what we have accomplished. My only regret is that we did not develop the bomb in time to use it on the Nazis. <laughs> 
To many, Oppenheimer was a hero for helping to end the war, but he was plagued by guilt. The physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge they cannot lose. I am heavy with grief and shame, and believe the time will come when mankind will curse the names of Los Alamos and Hiroshima. We must stop now before it is too late. For three years, Oppenheimer had been President Truman's chief advisor on nuclear energy. In January 1950, Secretary of State Dean Acheson summoned him to the White House. <clears throat> Dr. Oppenheimer. Good to see you again, Dean. We've just received some rather shocking news. Your colleague, Klaus Fuchs, has been arrested in London. Klaus? He's confessed to passing classified information to the Soviets. What information exactly? The atom bomb. Klaus Fuchs had worked under Oppenheimer at Los Alamos. But he was a communist spy. Fuchs confessed to giving the Soviets a blueprint of the atom bomb. Now a shocked White House wanted to know what other secrets the Soviets might have stolen from Oppenheimer's team. The president would like you to brief him on any other information your friend, Dr. Fuchs, has been privy to. Conversations regarding the hydrogen bomb, for example. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah. The president will see you now, Dr. Oppenheimer. Ever since discovering the full scale of the damage inflicted by his atom bomb, Oppenheimer had been against developing the hydrogen bomb that Edward Teller was pushing for. What do we think about the Nazis? They killed six million people. What will the world say about America and democracy if we kill six million people with our hydrogen bombs? Or 10 million, or 20 million? They will not be used. <sighs> Their function is to prevent war. But that's insanity, Edward. Will we build the single most violent, destructive, indiscriminate weapon ever conceived by mankind to prevent war? A weapon so randomly destructive it cannot possibly have a military value. It's not a weapon of war. It's a weapon of genocide. Perhaps so. But you are naive. Naive. If you believe that Russian scientists will not also be considering how to fuse isotopes of hydrogen, and if they build a hydrogen bomb, then we must build the hydrogen bomb. It is beyond morality. We have no choice. The president backed Edward Teller, and with the Soviets getting the atom bomb so fast, no one was above suspicion. Good afternoon, Dr. Oppenheimer. He's gone, Mr. President. Don't bring that guy around here again. Goddamn crybaby scientist. Spent most of his time wringing his hands and telling me they had blood on them. For Pete's sake, he just built the bomb. I'm the guy who fired it off. Good afternoon, Mr. Atchison. Based largely on Fuchs's information, Soviet scientists had built the atom bomb from scratch in four years. Now, Stalin ordered them to build the hydrogen bomb. The rising young star of Soviet physics, Andrei Sakharov, was instructed to leave his family and work on the new weapon. Hello, my name is Sakharov. I was told to report here. I know who you are. You are going to the installation. The installation? to Azamas 16. 250 miles east of Moscow, Azamas 16 was an entire city devoted to the Soviet nuclear bomb. Thousands of prisoners from Stalin's notorious labor camps 
had been forced to build it at gunpoint. It was so secret, it appeared on no maps. The project was headed by the man who had built the Soviet atom bomb, Igor Kurchatov. <laughs> Welcome to the installation. You must be Andrei Dmitrievich. It's a pleasure to meet you. It is a pleasure to meet you too, comrade... Uh... Kurchatov. Ah. Come inside, come. <laughs> the Soviets had taken the lead. In America, Oppenheimer remained resolutely opposed to the H-bomb. But Teller had found a powerful ally in a member of America's Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss. For 10 years, I have wanted to build a hydrogen bomb for America. And for 10 years, he has stood in my way. Why? I don't know. Perhaps because he does not wish his achievement to be eclipsed by a greater one. <laughs> exactly, Edward. Exactly. And God knows, the hydrogen bomb will be to the atom bomb what the atom bomb was to dynamite. A thousand times more powerful, but still not as big as Oppenheimer's ego. <laughs> You know, there's a rumor that he's on the Kremlin payroll. I know. I started it. Would you gentlemen like something to eat? Just coffee, please, black. Coffee, cream, and sugar, please. His wife was a member of the Communist Party. His brother, his mistress, his friends, all communists. That doesn't necessarily mean he's a spy. Does it make him fit to advise the president on nuclear policy? Let me ask you, what is the effect of his constant attempts to block the H-bomb? Gentlemen. Thank you. Except to give the Soviet Union time to catch up with our weapons research. Is this man a fool? Or does he think we are? Strauss and Teller joined forces and soon got what they wanted. The Communist Alliance holds nearly half the world's population in its grip and threatens the rest with its latest and deadliest acquisition, the atom bomb. Today, America gave its reply. President Truman announced that we will build the hydrogen bomb. Our homes, our nation, all the things we believe in are in great danger. The future of civilization depends on what we do. What kind of idiot do we have for a president? OK to the H-bomb, he says. It's broadcast to the whole world that we're going to make a hydrogen bomb. We don't even know how to make one. Can't think of anything worse that you could have done. I mean, how does he think the Soviets are going to react? I expect they'll be pissed. This isn't a joking matter, Kitty. Do we really have to go tonight? These Washington parties are so dull. A stands for atom. It is so small, no one has ever seen it at all. B stands for bombs. The bombs are much bigger, so brother, do not be too fast on the trigger. F stands for fission. That is what things do when they get too wobbly. Oh my God, here comes Strauss. Keep your counsel, Jay Roberts. Dr. Oppenheimer. Admiral Strauss. Good of you to accept our invitation, Robert. Well. We were in town to loose end. Oh, and I was so hoping that you might have been gracious in defeat. Defeat? <laughs> oh, I don't think we're quite finished yet, Mr. Strauss. You have an unworkable design for an untestable bomb, so let's 
discuss victory and defeat at a later date, shall we? Always a pleasure. Kitty? You'll excuse us. Dr. Oppenheimer, any comment? Any comment, Dr. Oppenheimer? As of today, we are living in the age of the super bomb. The age of weapons of limitless power. There are people in this room who understand what that means. I understand what that means. However, the public does not. And I am unable to explain it to them because I am not permitted to do so. The scientists have been gagged. Will you be working on the H-bomb, Dr. Oppenheimer? Well, not even if they ask you to? I believe it is morally wrong. I believe it is against the interests of our national security. So why in heaven's name would I do so? This is the plague of Thebes, gentlemen. A man in your profession should be careful of what he says in public. You mean like Fuchs? Let's go, Robert. In Britain, Fuchs was sentenced to 14 years, but no one knew how much he had told the Soviets about the super. Teller expressed his concern to a friend. The damage that Fuchs has done is great. I am plagued by memories of our friendship. Like so many of us here, we are refugees trying to find our way. We are brothers. We spoke so often and in depth about our intensive efforts that I now feel somehow implicated and must make amends. That bomb was yesterday's weapon. The hydrogen bomb would be a thousand times more powerful. I am racking my brains to remember. Did I give away too much? The magic here, Klaus, will be the tritium. I am terribly anxious and quite doubtful whether we can keep up with the Russians in the atomic race. And finally, we can now confidently expect a witch hunt. Get that communist Joe. Get that News of Fuchs's treachery did help kickstart a witch hunt. Just on the battlefield, of one university as one communist to mine. Senator Joe McCarthy launched his campaign to root out all American communists. Are you a member of the communist conspiracy as of this moment? I respectfully decline to answer that question under the protection of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, and that my answer might and you should be watching this. This nut McCarthy. That'll be it, Dr. Oppenheimer. You're all finished. The president has made his decision. If you go on TV and badmouth him, people will say you're being disloyal. Disloyal? To be concerned about national security? They're proposing to waste untold precious resources on a bomb that won't work at the expense of plutonium production on a bomb that does. <laughs> disloyal. It's not what you say. It's what people think you say that matters. Kitty, what's wrong? I guess I feel responsible. For what? For making you a target. Oh, come on. We went to a couple of meetings. I was never that involved. Yes, but I was. That's how it works, isn't it? Guilt by association? Hey. Maybe. They know everything about me. And they knew about my past when they appointed me to the project. They cleared you because they needed you. You were useful to them. Now you're not so useful. Now you're just a guy with a big mouth. We're ready for you, Mr. Oppenheimer. Hey. A super bomb is a matter that touches the very basis of our morality. It is a weapon of unknown design, cost, and military value. And I'm not sure the miserable thing can be gotten to the target except by ox cart. After the Soviet bomb, Oppenheimer was tailed by the FBI. Get that communist Mr. Oppenheimer! Get that communist Mr. Oppenheimer! Get that communist Mr. Oppenheimer! Any comments? The super is a monster. We should not build it. 
That does not make me a communist. Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party, Mr. Oppenheimer? Mr. Oppenheimer! Despite Oppenheimer, President Truman pressed ahead with the H-bomb. Amid tightened security at Los Alamos, Edward Teller now began the project he had dreamt of for years. Our project is to create the energy of the sun, to create nuclear fusion, to create it here on Earth. We must work as if our lives depended on it, which, gentlemen, I truly believe they do. It was a scientific leap into the unknown. By fusing hydrogen atoms together, Teller hoped to recreate the process that powers the sun. The only power on Earth great enough to drive the hydrogen atoms together was Oppenheimer's atom bomb. But that would just be the trigger for the super. Teller promised to deliver within two years. I am more satisfied than I have been in the last 35 years. I love the job I'm going to do. The Americans feared Fuchs had given the Soviets everything Teller knew. The FBI sent agent Robert Lamphere to London. Commander Arnold. Agent Lamphere. Klaus, did you or did you not pass on secrets of the H-bomb to the Russians? The Soviets faced a key decision. Zakharov had seen all Fuchs's information, but wanted to go his own way. Sorry to keep you waiting, gentlemen. Sorry. <clears throat> Everybody, I want to introduce you to Andrei Dmitrievich Zakharov. Some of you will already be familiar with his work in gas dynamics. But perhaps he will consent to say a few words about his new design. <laughs> if I may, uh, I call it the layer cake. Quite simply, a fission core is encased in a layer of fusible material and then a layer of conventional explosive to implode the whole device. The icing on the cake, as it were. Its explosive yield is not going to be in the megaton range, but still potentially in the hundreds of kilotons. And what I like about it is we can actually test it. Zakharov's bomb would be far less powerful than Teller's, but far simpler to build. Teller's complex design depended on a chain of nuclear reactions firing off at the heart of the bomb. Mathematician Stan Ulam was in charge of the calculations. What are you saying, Stan? The model considered is a fizzle? What does this mean? The model considered is a fizzle. Well, exactly that, Edward. The results point to the progress of the reaction being mediocre, even given a large amount of tritium. No, no. <clears throat> You've made a mistake. There is some... some bias in your samples. Edward, something you should perhaps consider. Maybe these calculations reveal a flaw in your design. There is no flaw in the design. Your work is false. I don't believe a word. Take me to my office. Ulam's results were soon confirmed at Princeton University by one of the world's first digital computers. I guess you heard that. Yeah. To make a super bomb would require uh, three, four, five kilograms of tritium fuel. Evidently. Rather more than you predicted. About 30 to 50 times more. It's uh, quite a discrepancy. Is there a point to this? Or are you just calling to crawl? The point is, Edward, to make a bomb, to make a super bomb to your specifications would absorb up to five years of reactor effort, and it's simply impractical. You need to go back to the drawing board on this. Thanks for your help, Robert. We'd love you here.
Vrenty Pavlovich Beria ran the Soviet nuclear project. The tyrannical chief of the secret police condemned thousands of prisoners to death building nuclear reactors and mining uranium with no protection. But the Soviets still faced endless shortages. Why are things moving so slowly? I've received reports about a lack of lithium-6. Yes, it's true. There are delays in starting the production of lithium-6. Without it, we can't test Comrade Sakharov's device. I'm afraid we are at something of an impact. The necessary works are very nearly complete. But we're still waiting for certain building materials, such as roofing felt. A roofing felt? Yes, apparently there's a shortage. Your task, as I understand it, is to ensure that lithium-6 separation starts as soon as possible. Yes. Does the roofing felt form a part of that process? No. Not Renty Pavlovich. Sakharov! I have a direct message for you from Comrade Stalin. By the way, how's your wife? My wife is well, thank you. Your country needs you now to demonstrate that we can match the Americans kiloton for kiloton, megaton for megaton. Results, Edward. We need results. I've got to be seeing something. Still, with no working design, Teller faced mounting criticism, even from his ally, Louis Strauss. There's a lot of talk around town, Edward, that you've led the nation on a wild goose chase. A lot of trust has been put in you. A lot of money. Some people are saying you've made some bad choices. Of course. We lack a manufacturing base to rival the Americans. But we have one thing they do not. Belief. Of course, the root problem is the quality of the staff at Los Alamos. They are all such unmitigated mediocrities, totally lacking in drive and imagination. And what it comes down to? Oppenheimer. While their scientists argue with each other in public like schoolboys, ours are side by side in the laboratories, working together in a common purpose. Some of the foremost physicists in the world, I have approached them directly. They have turned me down. Why? Again, Oppenheimer. They're all under his spell. Whatever he says, they believe. Problem is, all the derogatory information on Oppenheimer is old hat. What we need is something no. <clears throat> the FBI soon found something new. Yeah, so the project depends on they suspected that while Fuchs was working under Oppenheimer, his contact had been pharmacist Harry Gold. But they needed Fuchs's confirmation. I want names, and I want dates. I'm not leaving here until I have them. Well. After six days, Fuchs finally cracked. I knew him as Raymond. Here, from Moscow. Gold's exposure as Raymond was a massive breakthrough. It soon led to the arrest of Julius Rosenberg and his wife, Ethel. Both were implicated in the ferrying of information from Los Alamos to the Soviets. As evidence of wartime espionage mounted, Oppenheimer fell under intense scrutiny. You've seen enough now, Mr. F.B. fucking I, man! You've had enough to kill Let's get some rest, huh? Don't patronize me, Robert. I haven't had a drop. 
Turn that goddamn radio off. The West was increasingly alarmed by the Red Threat. In June 1950, UN forces went to war to stop South Korea falling into communist hands. The fact that communist forces have invaded Korea is a warning that there may be similar acts of aggression in other parts of the world. The Cold War was at its height, and the race for the H-bomb was at the heart of it. Our test device will be positioned on a tower at point H. At H plus one, we have erected a series of structures to study the impact of the blast. Why? Why would we want to study the impact of the blast? Well, comrade, this test provides us with yes. a great opportunity. Yes, yes, yes. All right, then. I tell you how it will be. Every structure, every animal, every military vehicle, Every inanimate object or sentient being you place in the shadow of this bomb will be wiped from the face of the earth. I want Americans to know that this is how it will be. On the battlefront in Korea, United Nations forces fight desperately to meet the red attack. In Korea, American troops suffered heavy casualties. Fears grew that President Truman would again resort to the atom bomb. Careful, will you? This is explosives. Sorry. Ten months into the hydrogen bomb project, the scientists at Los Alamos found a way forward. Ulam and Teller realized the heat and pressure from the atom bomb wouldn't be enough to trigger the super, but something else would. You know, it occurs to me that with the higher yield weapons, the energy released is predominantly radiation, something in the order of 80%. In the primary? Yes, the primary. <laughs> now, <laughs> what if we capture the x-rays when the bomb is detonated? We channel the As the president's the chief nuclear advisor, Oppenheimer took an immediate interest. Oppen, I think this is it. I cracked it. Good morning, Edward. Yes, good morning. I've done it. I, Edward? Surely you mean we. Didn't Stan have something to do with it? Yes, Stan contributed some small part. But Oppie, I've... We've cracked it. Let's go for a drive. The X-rays implode the second stage of the device, the plutonium rod, or spark plug, at the core of the secondary, which fissions. Teller now the saw that radiation from Oppenheimer's atom bomb was the key to igniting his own H-bomb. Your solution to the ignition problem is technically very sweet. Congratulations. Is that it? No moral objections? We both know it would be folly for me to oppose the exploration of this new weapon. But that we become committed to it as a way to save our country and the peace appears to me to be full of danger. The Americans now prepare to unleash the biggest explosion ever created by man. The site? Any Wetak Islands in the Pacific. 10,000 staff raced to prepare for a test in the autumn of 1952. Codenamed Ivy Mike, the bomb weighed 65 tons. Too big to be dropped from a plane, it was housed in a giant hangar. 
But Edward Teller, its chief designer, wouldn't be there. After conflict over his leadership style, he resigned. Oppenheimer was convinced the test would intensify the world crisis. He asked the president to stop it. Assured by his advisors that it was safe, Truman gave the go-ahead. You have a grandstand seat here to one of the most momentous events in the history of science. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. For the sake of all of us, and for the sake of our country, I know that you join me in wishing this expedition well. It is now 30 seconds to zero time. Put on goggles or turn away. Do not remove goggles or face first until 10 seconds after the first light. fireball recreated every element the universe had ever seen. It was equivalent to a thousand Hiroshima's. Nearly 5,000 miles away, Teller watched the birth of his bomb. I want to send a telegram to Dr. Robert Oppenheimer. What is your message, sir? It's a boy. Congratulations, sir. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Commander Wolf. Uh, that was the commander of the aircraft carrier, 35 miles out from the the blast site. He said, the blast took out the horizon. Can you imagine that, Kitty? Took out the entire horizon from 35 miles out. They vaporized an entire island, clean blew it out of the ocean, and then it turned into this dust cloud. It's now circling the earth and showering us all with radioactive fallout. He said the blast was so intense that it uh, stripped the entire animal of anything living, anything growing, anything walking. Birds just fell out of the sky, black as cinders. <sighs> Who cares about the birds, right? <laughs> Who cares about the fucking birds? <sighs> oh, Robert, what did you expect? I expected it not to work. How could it fail? You helped build it up. Bomb, bomb, hydrogen bomb. Bomb, bomb, hydrogen bomb. It's a big loud noise and you're real gone. Bomb, bomb, the hydrogen bomb. The Americans now began designing an H-bomb that could be dropped from a plane. In 1953, Eisenhower took over as president and immediately increased spending on nuclear weapons. We are forced to concentrate on building such stores of armaments as can deter any attack against those who want to be free. That year, the Soviets lost the leaders of their nuclear program. With the deepest regret that we inform you that our great leader and comrade, Yosef Vesserionovich Stalin, has died. A power struggle broke out in the Soviet Union. 
going on. Beria's rivals called him to a meeting. It was an ambush. <laughs> Two months after Beria's downfall, the Soviet H-bomb was ready. We must evacuate everyone downwind of ground zero. It would mean moving tens of thousands of people. You do realize that. Taking into account possible changes in wind direction, this is the area we believe must be cleared. Tens of thousands of people were then evacuated. Sakharov later described the explosion. A shockwave blasted my ears and struck a sharp blow to my entire body. Then there was a prolonged, ominous rumble that slowly died away after 30 seconds or so. I could see a stupendous cloud trailing streamers of purple dust. The cloud turned gray and swirled upward, shimmering with gleams of orange. Within minutes, the cloud, which now filled half the sky, turned a sinister blue-black color. The Soviet H-bomb had arrived several years earlier than the CIA had predicted, fueling suspicions there were still spies at large in America. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg had recently been sent to the electric chair for passing nuclear secrets to the Soviets. Their case was a reminder to all Americans of the fate awaiting communist spies. Let's be clear on this, Edward. You think Oppenheimer has been spying for the Soviets? I don't say that. Okay. He has been blocking the H-bomb. This is a matter of public record. Why? I don't say that he receives direct instructions from Moscow, no. But who needs instructions when he is sympathetic to the cause? He knows what to do, and he does it. Thank you, Dr. Teller. Appointed by Eisenhower as the new head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Strauss now set out to destroy the father of the atom bomb. Oppenheimer was in London delivering the BBC's Wreath Lectures. Communism is not man's fate, it is not his path. To force him on it makes him resemble not that divine image of the all-knowing, all-powerful but the helpless, iron-bound prisoner of a dying world. His dogma limits the open society, the unrestricted access to knowledge, the unplanned, uninhibited association of men for its furtherance. Within five days of his appointment, Strauss ordered the FBI to seize all Oppenheimer's classified files. This was tantamount to accusing him of being a spy. Check the mail, Robert. I gotta take these shoes off. On his return, Oppenheimer was summoned to Washington. On instructions from the president, the Atomic Energy Commission has revoked your security clearance. We have made a list of our reasons for this action. Reasons? <laughs> Isn't this a charge sheet? Well, I guess I always expected this day to come. Let's have a look here. Between 1936 and 1941, I did indeed associate with known communists. I married one. Subscribed to party journals. No, you got that wrong. I never really subscribed. Employed communists to work on the Manhattan Project. 
You know, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. Oh, but look here, our old friend, the H-bomb. This is new. Well, attempted to retard atomic weapons development, in particular the H-bomb. Well, I did express an opinion on the H-bomb. I guess that's what this is about, huh? If you wish to make light of it, Robert. No, I am not making light of it. How do you think I should respond, Lewis? Hmm? Should I resign? That choice is up to you, Robert. Yes, it is for me to decide. And I'm going to have to think about this one. We'll need your response by tomorrow. Well, I better consult my lawyer then. I'm afraid not. For security reasons, you understand. <laughs> well, I am beginning to, Lewis. Dear Lewis, I have decided not to resign. To do so would mean that I accept the view that I am not fit to serve this government that I have now, sir, for some 12 years. This I cannot do. If I was thus unworthy... Were thus unworthy. If I were thus unworthy, Mrs. Oppenheimer, I could hardly have served this country as I have tried or have spoken as I have often found myself speaking in the name of our science and our country. I'm going to request a public hearing, Kitty. I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to tell Strauss in person. Will you come with me? No. Only if we can stop at Bloomingdale's first. <laughs> Bloomingdale's? <laughs> The Americans were ready to test their new super. Less than a quarter of the weight of Ivy Mike, it would create the biggest explosion ever seen. It was nicknamed the Shrimp. We have made a thing, the most terrible weapon that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world, a thing that by the standards of the time that we grew up in is an evil thing. And by so doing, we have raised the question once again, is science good for man? We are scientists, just scientists, not armament manufacturers. And this weapon, this new, this novel weapon of ours is by definition a weapon of terror and aggression, a weapon for aggressors. The size of the blast had been grossly underestimated. Uh, is it true that the American H-bomb test, in effect, ran out of control? No, no. The, the yield was about double that of the calculated estimates, a margin of error not incompatible with a totally new weapon. Over 80 miles from the explosion, a Japanese fishing boat was showered with radioactive fallout. Uh, Mr. Stress, how about some basic info on the H-bomb, please? Uh, its size compared to the atom bomb. It can be made as large as you wish, large enough to take out a city. How big a city? Moscow, Berlin, any city. Any city. New York City. The, um, the metropolitan area? Yes. No more comments. Strauss had done what Oppenheimer had always wanted to do, alert America to the full horror of the super. It can destroy any city. That means Fort Worth and Dallas, or Houston, San Antonio, Amarillo, El Paso, yes, Johnson City. You will know when it comes. It looks something like this. But if you duck and cover like Bert, 
will be much safer. Oh, I hold the hydrogen bomb. Bless it all. Let it fall. Oh, I hold the hydrogen bomb. God have mercy on me. The world prepared to face a nuclear onslaught. Товарищи, не волнуйтесь. Во время воздушной тревоги весь городской транспорт выходит за черту города, где жители будут в большей безопасности. I'm going to explain to you the system of warning signals that will be used in this country in the event of a nuclear attack. Where sirens have not yet been provided, the grey warning may also be given by church bells. Or in Scotland, where church bells are not in common use, by word of mouth or by whistle. In Washington, Oppenheimer contested the suspension of his security clearance. He was fighting for his reputation and his career. Eminent scientists testified on his behalf. I believe that this board has made a mistake. This bill of particulars is quite capable of being interpreted as placing this man on trial because he held opinions, which is quite contrary to the American system. We have an A-bomb because of this man, a whole series of them. Of course, you don't know what the file before the board has disclosed. No, but I think any incident in a man's life, you, you have to take it in sum. What made him act? What he did? What kind of a person he is? That's what you're really doing here. You're writing a man's life. The odds were stacked against Oppenheimer. Okay, so what are you showing me? What, what we got on With the what president's approval, even his lawyer's office was bugged. No, Next witness, please, Mrs. Oppenheimer. Mrs. Oppenheimer, how did you leave the Communist Party? By walking away. <laughs> did you have a card? Yes. Did you turn it in or tear this up? I have no idea. On the 28th of April, the prosecution brought in their star witness, Edward Teller. Is it your intention, in anything you're about to testify to, to suggest that Dr. Oppenheimer is disloyal to the United States? I do not want to suggest anything of the kind. I know Oppenheimer as an intellectually most alert and a very complicated person. And I think it would be presumptuous and wrong on my part if I would try in any way to analyze his motives. But I have always assumed, and I now assume, that he is loyal to the United States. Now, a question which is the corollary of that. Do you or do you not believe that Dr. Oppenheimer is a security risk? In a great number of cases, I have seen Dr. Oppenheimer act in a way which was, to me, exceedingly hard to understand. I thoroughly disagreed with him in numerous issues, and his actions, frankly, appeared to me confused and complicated. To this extent, I feel that I would like to see the vital interests of this country in hands which I understand better, and therefore trust more. Thank you, Dr. Teller. You may go. Teller's testimony was the final blow. I'm sorry. After what you just said, I don't know what you mean. The panel concluded Oppenheimer had a susceptibility to influence that could have serious implications for the security interests of the country. They upheld the withdrawal of his security clearance. Oppenheimer was ruined. In the forest, in battle, out on the great sea, at the precipice's edge, in the mountains, in sleep, 
in delirium in deep trouble. Good deeds a man has done before defend him. Someone remind me what my good deeds are. The nuclear arms race had lost its most powerful opponent. One year later, the Soviet Union became the first country to drop a hydrogen bomb from a plane. Sakharov soon heard that the test had claimed innocent victims. Fourteen years later, he enraged the authorities by expressing his alarm over the power he had helped unleash. What troubles me now is this. Thermonuclear weapons could end human civilizations. They have become so frightening that the very thought of using them seems unreal. Their credibility as a deterrent has thus decreased, while their threat has increased enormously. In 1956, the Americans tested their first airborne hydrogen bomb. After speaking out against the arms race, Sakharov was banned from all nuclear research and became a leading dissident. Teller's career flourished. He advised successive presidents on the nuclear arms race. Oppenheimer was later honored for his work, but his reputation was shattered. He died of cancer in 1967. In 1952, Britain got the bomb. In 1964, China. That same year, France. We and our supposed enemy are likened to two scorpions in a bottle, both capable of killing the other, but only at the risk of their own lives. Mankind certainly has the capability to destroy itself. And only the greatest act of faith could persuade us that what will be left will be human. Some legacy, huh? World peace now relied on a new concept. Mutually assured destruction. Mad. Next week on Nuclear Secrets, the atom bomb spreads to the Middle East. Israel is building a huge nuclear war machine. The most volatile region on Earth. Israel does not want peace. Bullshit! One man risks his life to expose an international conspiracy of silence. I didn't want to be a hero, but no one else would do it. And that's at 9 o'clock next Monday. Next tonight, the power of prayer in Trust Me, I'm a Healer.